Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Chad here from Moss Pawn and Gun. Today we're going to be covering another firearms fact video and uh, we've had a lot of firearms facts kind of in the queue and, and trying to get them ready to, to do and get them done for you guys. Um, we've had a lot of requests and a lot of people send in ideas, uh, but what we want to discuss for you today is covering the NFA, okay, the National Firearms Act. And things that are covered under the NFA involve uh, the legalities of certain configurations of firearms, uh, primarily, well, of course, just in the United States. Now, uh, what the NFA deals with is in items that have to be registered with the federal government uh, in order to own those particular items. So there's a lot of misconceptions about NFA law, yeah. about rulings, about what constitutes an NFA weapon, what doesn't, um, what you can own, what you can't own. A lot of folks are very, very confused, and the purpose of this video is that we want to cover a lot of the most common misconceptions that folks have about NFA items. Well, and also misinformation. There's a lot of people that yeah. come in that say, yeah, my buddy told me this, but, oh, well, that's not right. And then you have to kind of start over and, yeah. you know, explain it to them. And there's a lot of people that come in that think we have machine guns on the wall. That's not the case. You know, semi-automatic pistols or automatic pistols doesn't work that way. So we're trying to clear the air a little bit and, you know, give you guys some really good information regarding the NFA, the process to own these type of firearms. Now, not everything on the table here is NFA, but we've got a lot here to discuss and just show you different configurations of those said firearms. It's funny, too, because when you look at, like, the media and everything that, you know, of course, any black rifle is a machine gun, is an assault, assault weapon, rifle, is all yeah. this stuff and all. So there's a lot of misconceptions, not only in the media, but I think that even in, like, let's just say the education system, when people go through school, um, uh, you know, many teachers by default a lot of times tend to be a little bit on the anti gun side <laughs> a and bit. a lot of those teachers will put out per and sometimes purposely uh, misinformation oh well you can't own suppressors you know there's people come in here and go wait aren't suppressors illegal so many people are misinformed and they think that you can't own a suppressor you can't have you know certain guns so we're going to go through and uh, talk about some of the terminology um, talk about some of the features talk about what you can have without paperwork what you have to have paperwork to get and then hopefully you guys will come away from this video sort of gleaning some information about the process and uh, and the guns uh, contained hereof. So the easiest thing to do, I guess, would start with the NFA itself, which stands for National Firearms Act, which was an act that was in, enacted in 1934, if I'm not mistaken. It was kind of during the gangster era. You know, there was a lot of crime going on and whatnot. There were um, gangsters out there cutting down shotguns, uh, you know, making fully automatic bars or, you know, taking bar um, um, machine guns, basically, and cutting them down, chopping them off and, you know, hiding them under the coat, going around, robbing banks like Bonnie and Clyde, you know, very popular criminal couple. You yep. know, and the NFA was kind of created to kind of equalize the, the playing field. Yep. And back then, a $200 tax, which is what was um, enacted to own NFA firearms, was a lot of money. It comes out to be about like $3,600 today with inflation, but there was never a rule applied to it to increase with inflation over the years. That's why it's so cheap nowadays. You think 200 bucks, it's not a terrible amount of money to own something. More but of a burden. It's, it's more of a burden, and it's just, it's... You know, it's a, a tax to uh, use your freedoms that should be given to you anyways. Well, so. before the NFA was around, guys, you could uh, call up Sears and Roebuck or any of your, you know, catalog mail order stores, and you could order a Thompson mm -hmm. and have it dropped right on your uh, doorstep. Yeah, and get you a 1928 and just, oh, just, you know, here, there it is, the postman yeah, brings you it. Could, you, I mean, <laughs> a lot of folks, they don't realize that before all this stuff, you know, happened, before we had any kind of... Uh, laws or rules that surrounded the way that FFLs handle purchases or even creating a such thing as an FFL. Mm. You could just go to a hardware store and buy a machine gun or anything uh, well, related to that and it wasn't that, a big deal. That was actually even up to 1968 for the, you know, before the Gun Control Act. I mean, right. you know, any hardware store or department store, you could walk in, you could buy a firearm right over the counter yep. and there was no background check, no paperwork or anything like that involved with it until 1968. Well, you know, my grandpa so. used to tell me stories of when his dad would send him down to the hardware store to buy dynamite for yep. his dad to blow up stumps. Oh, yeah. And back then, you know, everyone knew each other. It wasn't a big deal. And you'd walk into the, oh, well, that's the that's the so-and-so boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's good. He's getting it for old old Vernon down the road, and he's just going to be blowing up some stumps. That's fine. Just send him on his way. Yep. And everybody knew each other. It wasn't a big deal. And folks were trusted. You know, you, it wasn't a, 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 a retroactive punishment for something you may or may not do. It was just more of a, uh, that's the way things were, and people just respected and understood that. Now, getting back to NFA... Um, essentially, there's certain configurations that guns have to be in to be sold over the counter, you know, through an FFL. Now, generally speaking, 
Uh, there are some exceptions to the rule, of course, but generally speaking, shotguns must have a barrel length of 18 inches or more, a minimum of 18, okay? And the overall length of said shotgun in a fireable condition has to be 26 inches. Mm -hmm. All right, same thing for rifles, 26 inch overall length, but uh, rifles can have a 16 inch barrel. Well, they have to have a 16 inch right. barrel. Right, so, correct. Yeah. So 16 or longer, that's why anytime you see a barrel that's shorter, uh, you know, it, it's obviously going to be fall into what they call NFA territory, unless you're talking pistols. So mm -hmm. it's one of these random things. And essentially the way that shotguns and rifles work with NFA is it has to do with the overall length, the barrel length, and the overall configuration it's sold uh, at, at the factory. So, for instance, like right. Chad here's has a, a little, double barrel. All right. This is a little 311A, like a little uh, Stevens, okay? Now, this is an over-the-counter shotgun, okay? It's got uh, probably a 26 or 28-inch barrel, two barrels now. You see a lot of these in a the configuration where the stock is chopped off, and you just have a little grip here, and then the barrels are cut, you know, 10, 12 inches right in front of the handguard here. Now, that would constitute what would be considered in any other weapon, I believe, or an SBS, one of the two. They're, they're very ambiguous in their descriptions of the any other weapon category and the short barrel shotgun category. Correct. So uh, you can make your, so say that I buy this gun from an FFL dealer or whatever, that gun in its current configuration, I could cut those barrels down to 18 inches, not a problem. Mm -hmm. Now most people that shorten barrels, they cut them down to 18 and a half and they leave themselves a half of an inch. Just to be safe. Just to be safe in case some overzealous ATF agent wants to give them a really hard time and get, get real funky with it. Now that same gun, all right, say I wanted to fill out a Form 1 and uh, turn in my trust, submit a $200 tax stamp, and by the way, I'd probably pay $200 for the gun. So I'd buy the gun for 200 bucks, pay the $200 tax stamp, submit a Form 1, and give them the overall length of the stock, uh, the complete gun, the overall length of the barrel. And basically, once I do that and they approve the tax stamp, if I wanted to cut that down in front of the handguard and cut it down to, let's say, a 10-inch barrel and make it, you know, a cool little, you know, shot a spreader. A little Mad Max blaster. A little you know? Mad Max blaster or something. I could do that legally, and anyone can. Uh, provided you submit the proper paperwork. And speaking of the paperwork with the NFA, and we got a lot to go over here, but there's two forms that are really pertinent in the civilian realm, Form 1 and a Form 4. Mm -hmm. Form 1 is a manufacturer form. So that's if you want to take a rifle or a shotgun that you currently own or even a pistol and you want to manufacture it into a NFA format, then you file a Form 1. Now, right. there's two ways of doing that. There's one way as an individual, and there's another way as a trust or a corporation. Now trusts are basically, you, you create a gun trust, okay? It's like basically a corporation with, with your initials and trust. You know, like Eric and I both have one and we can have multiple people on that said trust. And since it is an entity and not an individual, you don't have to go through a fingerprinting process. You don't have to have a chief law enforcement sign off on your paperwork in order to get that form processed. Yep. And you can utilize the ATF's e-form system, which, in which the paperwork actually comes back a lot quicker. And we've yeah, gotten guys. paperwork back within 32 days. I had an yep. SBR come back in 32 days. Eric had a couple come back in about 45 days. Normally the yep. wait is four or five months for the paper-based system. So there's two different ways of doing that. If you're interested in a trust, just talk to your local like NFA lawyer or a lawyer that deals in the firearms industry a lot and they'll be able to help you out with that. The trusts are one of the biggest breakthroughs really in, in the whole gun industry over the last couple of years. Trusts have been extremely popular. Uh, they have fallen under a little bit of flack uh, from have. various people. and. You can sort of understand, so say that some uh, rapper or whoever wants to have a safe full of SBSs and SBRs and suppressors or some person Transferable that, machine transferable guns. Transferable machine guns, or say that that person knows that for whatever reason they can't own those types of items and if they submitted it as an individual, uh, they wouldn't be able to own such items. Or their local Clio is just completely unwilling to sign off on those items, which is another reason to have a trust. Uh, they might get their bodyguard or, or someone that works within their organization to add them to their trust and you're sort of creating more or less kind of a backdoor way of that guy obtaining those those said firearms legally Le and legally yeah, it's legal. legally now so. you have to look at both ends of the spectrum I think trusts are a great idea but guys the word trust is in the title of the document it is a trust so it means that you know you don't go putting buddy so-and-so or whoever you got to make sure whoever's added to your trust is somebody you hey trust 
All right, so then you've got on the flip side, you have Form 4s. Now, Form 4s are where you want to register an existing uh, SBS, SBR, AOW suppressor mm -hmm. that a manufacturer made and sent to a dealer and you bought it from a dealer. Mm -hmm. so, a class 3 dealer. Yeah, like so, so I've got this Tyrant, AAC Tyrant, mm -hmm. uh, which is a can I'm going to be getting very soon. I've been working with. This is the full size. It's a 45 ACP suppressor. All different types of suppressor manufacturers produce suppressors. They're brand new. They're not old or anything like that. They make them and they send them to the dealers. Uh, the dealer has to have a certain uh, licensing system in order to uh, take them into their inventory, put them out for sale. And then once that particular suppressor is purchased, they fill out a Form 4 mm -hmm. as an individual or they can do it under a trust as mm -hmm. well. Now those have to go in at the time of this video in a paper format, not an e-form. Right now, uh, there are no e-forms set up for Form 4s yet. Those are still in the works. Well, they, when, the, when the ATF originally set up the e-form system, uh, it basically got overwhelmed. You know, their servers were not set up to handle the the traffic that actually came that they were not um, that, that they they didn't estimate for, right. and uh, they basically basically we <laughs> we as people as gun owners and whatnot we blew up their servers. We did, and they just shut the e form process down for a while, and they just opened it back up uh, not terribly long ago for form ones. And then also a few other forms that are for like dealer to dealer transfers or manufacturer to dealer transfers, that sort of thing. But form fours are coming, but we just don't know when. They're just trying to get everything revamped for that. Yep. But the form fours, easy way to think about it is it's an over the counter form. If you right. want to go into a shop and buy an item that they have in stock, you've got to fill out a Form 4, and the wait on that is down to about four or five months in a lot of cases. It used to be about nine months to 12 months, right. but they've hired a lot of extra people on to actually oh, yeah. condense it down and, and well, get guys, the work done. Here's the easiest way to explain an SBR. Okay, SBR is a short barreled rifle. Okay, essentially, all right, now you're going to have to get your thinking caps on here. So for you that are not familiar, you're going to go, wait a minute, what? Okay, so this is a masterpiece pistol. This is considered a pistol. If I buy this for, you know, from a dealer or whatever on a 4473, this is considered a handgun, okay? But under the NFA and under all these rules, I cannot put a shoulder stock on this because then it becomes a short barrel rifle. It's not no longer a pistol. It's no longer intended to be fired with one hand or whatever. It's then a short barrel rifle. A pistol, you cannot put a vertical foregrip on. Okay, you're not supposed to run that on, on well, a handgun. It goes against okay. the ruling for what a handgun or a pistol is. You can't a handgun is not meant to be fired with two hands. Okay. Only one hand. So. so here's this configuration. This is a you know Mac ten style pistol from Masterpiece Arms. They're produced here in Comer, Georgia. This is a pistol. This is an SBR. This is a factory SBR from Masterpiece Arms. Okay. Folding stock. Okay. Forward grip. The gun is essentially the same gun, more or less, but has a folding stock and a forward grip. A lot of folks will erroneously purchase a firearm and then end up putting said firearm in whatever configuration they think is just cool and unknowingly be in violation of the NFA. And we've seen it on numerous occasions. We've had guns come in the shop here where a guy's got like a little tiny AR, you know, seven inch barrel, and we're thinking, okay, cool, where's your, you know, where's your tax stamp? What? What tax stamp are you talking about? Right. So the thing is, is knowing the configurations. Now, here's the weird thing, okay? Form 1 versus Form 4. Form 4. This is a factory SBR. All right? This is a Form 4 item. It's on the shop right here, ready to sell to you right now. That's a Form 4. But, okay, I take this gun, which is just a pistol, buy it, okay? Send in a uh, form one. Looks more one. menacing that way. What's that? Looks more menacing that way. It does look more oh, menacing. And this is a faux suppressor. That's not yeah, a real suppressor. Yeah, this is not a real suppressor. This is just a barrel extension. It just looks cool, okay? There's another thing, you know, people think, <laughs> oh, I see, it's not a suppressor. It just looks like a suppressor. So, all right, purchase this gun. The slot on the bottom of the receiver is already there for Masterpiece's factory folding mechanism. There's no difference in the configuration of the gun in terms of the way the accessories bolt in place other than the fact that this is a pistol. Buy the pistol, submit the Form 1, whether as an individual or as a trust. Form 1 comes back. Give the nice folks up at Masterpiece a call. Yes, um, I have a Form 1 on my uh, Masterpiece. Here's a copy of the tax stamp, whatever. They go, all right, we'll have you stock out in a few days. Bolt the stock on it. You're done. That's it. So that's just to give you an idea. Now, that's, that's what we would call short barrel 
uh, rifle. Okay, that's turning a pistol into a rifle. See, it's all about configurations. Well, so. there's a lot of other configurations out there too. I know you guys have seen this on the channel. This is a Chris Vector mm -hmm. SBR. This is a factory gun. Came to us like this with the EOTech, the Surefire, threaded muzzle, the whole nine yards, factory folding stock. Now, they do have these now with um, in a pistol format, which they've always had, and they have them in a full-length rifle format with a 16-inch barrel and a faux suppressor shroud, so you don't have a little dinky barrel hanging out of the end making it look all, all right, strange. There is a barrel under that thing, guys. <clears throat> that big shroud has a barrel. But you can, you can buy the rifle, and then later on, if you want an SBR, you actually have to send it back to Chris to have them install the proper barrel because it's a push-fit style system. You can't just drop it in. A lot of people buy the pistol and then it just has a little hinge on the side of it with a pin semi-permanently installed and you just buy the stock after you get your paperwork back and boom, there it is. It's There's a little bit more involved to do it, but yeah, it, it's pretty pretty simple to convert them yeah, over. Pretty now, basic compared to the, the thing, other you options. Know, some people are really savvy when it comes to putting uh, you know, these guns together and doing things. So some folks, okay, for instance, let's say I buy a Draco pistol. Um, Guys, as crazy as this rig looks and as awesome as it is, this is considered a handgun. It has the SIG arm brace on it. Well, that's the uh, SP-47. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is the SP-47. Now, guys, this is considered a handgun. It transfers as a handgun. Now, some of you guys are wondering, you're going, wait a minute, but Eric, that has a stock. It's not a stock. It's an arm brace. Now, if any of you guys have been in the gun world a while and you're, you're like us and you're very abreast with things going on in the gun world, um, this is actually a prosthetic device uh, that was created by a, or designed by a veteran to help uh, veterans and other people that have been wounded or hurt in combat or others with uh, very limited arm strength uh, due to injury or disability to properly hold uh, a pistol with one arm and allows them to shoot the pistol with, with greater control and help stabilize it to their arm. Uh, for those folks that have limited upper body strength, limited hand strength, like I said, due to injuries, this is not a stock. It is an arm brace. Now, there's been a lot of confusion in the uh, industry about, okay, well, well, Eric, it looks like a stock. I can put it against my shoulder, and I can, I can shoulder it. Chad is not shouldering this. It's no different than a buffer tube on an AR pistol. Now, again, we talked about pistol configuration versus rifle configuration. An AR-15 rifle has a buffer tube that is an integral part of the way the firearm functions. Mm -hmm. It's essential to the way the firearm functions. So if they allow a pistol, uh, AR-15, uh, then it has to have that tube in order to operate, okay? If someone takes said tube and puts it up to their cheek to try to you know, help stabilize the gun and look down the sights, there's nothing that, wrong with that. That's an integral part of the way you the know, There's a big operates. stink about, you know, the whole SB-15 arm brace deal right now. You know, uh, a lot of people question its legality, the ATF. Yeah, can you rulings, shoulder it? Can't you shoulder you know, it? They're, they're issuing opinions about it, and most of it is just that. It's opinions. But when everyone in the ATF is issuing a different opinion on the matter, one guy says, oh, well, it's okay, and the other guy says, oh, well, no, it's <clears> not. <throat> it gets a little bit confusing on the consumer spectrum especially when AR pistols have been around for years and people have been firing them with the buffer tube on their shoulder for years and it's never been an issue yeah. until someone designed something that looked like a stock. Well, there was even guys that would take like 550 cord and like wrap 550 oh, yeah. cord around them to make them bigger, make them a little easier to shoulder. Now guys, here's the random thing about the ATF and this is what to remember uh, when you're dealing with NFA, when you're kind of skating that line of, you know, whether you want to, you know, get into this sort of thing and, and get in, involved in it. The ATF looks strongly upon intent. Intent is everything. Intent, intent, intent. Mm -hmm. It's what you intend to do, not what you will do, not what you may do. It's what you intend to do. The, the ATF has to prove intent, and that's the biggest qualm, uh, qualm that I have with the arm brace is that, okay, well, they can say you can't shoulder that. Okay, well, that's fine, but the device is legal. You don't have to have any kind of medical records. You don't have to have a doctor's letter saying that you're physically disabled. Uh, you can buy the device. It comes with the ATF letter. You install said device, and uh, the reason you are purchasing the device is to use it in the manner in which it was produced and intended to be used in. Now, mm -hmm. the issue is, let's say that you um, went on social media or you went somewhere, and of course, I'm not stating this, but let's say that you went around bragging going, Oh, guys, look, I found a way to own an SBR without any paperwork. 
So that's when the ATF will go, hang on a second, this is an arm brace. This is not a stock. So you're saying that you were buying this device to use it specifically as a stock. They There's just cornered intent. you. There's your intent. Mm -hmm. So guys, here's the thing. If you want a dang SBR, build an SBR. You know, if you want an AK with a folding stock, wicked cool, hey, check it out. I mean, I just recently, finally got my paperwork back on my PAP. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got, you know, a ACE folder on my PAP now. It's awesome. I love it. I can fold it. I can shoulder it. I can shoot it under my leg, look cool like an action hero if I want, and no one cares. Guys, it's a it's a formed one SBR. Who cares? Well, and speaking of like you ARs, know. you know, uh, Eric was mentioning, you know, dropping a stock on a little MPA. Well, that's easy enough, but we were talking about the confusion that people have with um, the, the NFA laws and whatnot, and what's legal and what's not. Folks will drop a short upper on an AR lower, and it's, it's two pins. And it, it's really easy to make a mistake like that and not really realize it. But, um, you know, I've got um, uh, just an AR SBR that I built off a of Spikes receiver, and the thing's great. You know, I've got multiple short barreled uppers. I've got 556 five, uppers, a couple of 300 blackout uppers, one with an armor site thermal on it that's dedicated for like hog hunting, coyote hunting, yeah. whatever the case may be. We've got the PAPs. I mean, it, they're just fun toys, and that's really what they are. They are fun guns to play around they're with. They're very compact, they excellent are. for hunting. And guys, the thing is, it's like, you know, people are wondering about, okay, should I do an SBR, should I not? I, it, this would just, this is just my opinion, guys. Just me talking here. Mm -hmm. Take it for what you will. If you own an AR pistol and you own an AR rifle, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and take another receiver and just, just S make an SBR. You've got all because the bases covered, you've got then. all the bases covered, and it, it Again, it's a bad intent, but um, the ATF has a term that they call constructive possession. Mm -hmm. All right, now this is going to blow your mind, okay? Constructive possession means that you can create an item that would be controlled under the NFA, be it a machine gun, short barrel rifle, a short uh, suppressor, whatever, mm -hmm. but you haven't made said item, but you could make said item. So what the ATF says is, oh, well, this is, we're going to call this constructive possession. So, all right, here's a good example. Um, say I am a gunsmith and I have a shop full of parts, okay, and I have a, um, okay, AR-15 barrels that measure 7 inches, AR-15 barrels that measure 16 inches. Well, and I've got a mess of receivers, a mess of stuff. You know, technically, the configuration that the gun ends up getting built in could be up to me as a discretionary standpoint. Mm -hmm. Could the ATF say, oh, well, those guns could be built any way you want, therefore, therefore, it's constructive possession. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's quite that cut and dry because when it comes to those sort of things, and, I, and I'm not a legal authority, mm -hmm. but the ATF understands that AR is a very, very popular gun. People build pistol configurations, people build rifle configurations, so in certain fields, the finishing configuration that the gun ends up being in, that is the configuration. So if I have a short gas system, short barrel, tiny little pistol upper, and I build it into a pistol, well, guess what? It's a pistol. Who cares? So it's really random the, the way all of it gets done. So now, you know, we talked a little bit about SBRs. Let's talk about SBSs a little more. A little bit more. All right. Yeah. So. Eric mentioned the overall length, okay, 26 inches, overall length minimum for a shotgun. Well, the kel KSG is a bullpup style shotgun. It's not a, uh, it's not an SBS. It's got longer than an 18-inch barrel, and it measures about 28 or so inches, I believe. Just over 26. Just over 26, okay. Just over 26. Okay, well, just over 26. It's still legal. But this is the action. Your barrel starts right here. So you have a full-length barrel and a nice, short, compact package. This is the so. absolute smallest non-NFA shotgun that you can get. Actually. Uh, well, in a repeater. In a, in, a re in a repeater. Well, I have something for you on that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Remington has an 870 on the market, which I'm not sure if it's on the market. I've seen pictures and read things about it. It's, it might just be one of those unicorn-type things. But it is a factory 14-inch barreled Shotgun has a pistol grip, smooth bore, and it comes from the factory, and it's a non-NFA firearm. Mossberg did something very similar. They had, a, I believe, like a 14 or 15-inch barrel with yeah. a breecher, but in its current configuration, it is over the minimum legal limit, yet it has a short barrel and a pistol grip. It's, it's 
All right, guys, here's where the crux is on that. <laughs> I mean, the gun ships from the factory with a pistol grip installed, but it's never had a rifle stock put on it. Therefore, it is not considered an NFA item. Now, of course, they have, uh, apparently, I've heard they have NFA letters with them saying, you know, ATF letters saying that it is a legal configuration. You have the box showing non-NFA. Non I've seen them inch. for sale before. I've seen you them know? for sale. It's just crazy. Yeah, so, so guys, there's a lot of those little odd things that just kind of poke their heads out. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it comes to constructive possession, when it comes to being in compliance, when it comes to your intent, there's a lot of like random things. Now, the 26 and a half inch overall, 16 inch barrel rifle deal, uh, that has to do with the rifle and ready to fire configuration. Now this is obviously less than 26 inches. This is probably about 14 or 15 inches. 16, 16 inches. So 16 inches, but this Sub 2000 is not in ready to fire configuration right, right. now. Obviously, there's your chamber. You know, the you gun cannot be fired folded. So regardless of the position yep. that the gun is in prior to being unfolded or manipulated to put it into, into said mode now, that the gun is folded shut and ready to fire, it meets the overall length uh, requirements. So that's another gun. And kel -Tec has been known for making some guns that are in a way sort of an FU. Uh, grab you know. that SU-16 right there because that is precisely that. Yeah. Now All this right. SU-16 is kind of a weird bird here, guys. Uh, you know, it's a uh, piston-driven 5.56, uh, takes AR mags, has an underfolding stock. It's very lightweight, uh, very rigid barrel, reasonably good accuracy, good price for what they are. It's an excellent little little gun. It's 25 and a half inches overall length. Right. When they actually submitted the designs and everything, they had a flash hider on it, which brought it out to over 26 inches. But this is how they ship <laughs> with a muzzle cap. It's less than 26 inches, but <laughs> I mean, and even in and folded, it can be it can be fired. It can be fired from the folded configuration. The folded configuration. So. So hey, you know, you, you uh, tell me about that. There are a few one. little things like that that slip the little the gremlins that are out there that kind of <laughs> slip through the cracks. And guys. It, that gun's been out forever. It's not yeah. a problem at this point. It probably never will be. Well, and the 16 inch barrel thing, like this fugly here, this is a 14 and a half inch barrel with a permanently affixed muzzle device to bring the maximum length out to over 16 inches. A lot of people will put 14.5 inch um, barrels on their AR 15s. They'll get the barrel and then they'll bring them into the shop here or other gunsmiths around the area and they'll permanently affix the flash hider. Basically, all that means is cleaning the threads off threading the flash hider on, making sure that it's going to meet the minimum length requirements, drill through with a hardened drill bit, put a hardened pin in, and you weld it shut. That's pinned it. it. That's what they call pinned and welded. Mm -hmm. So this Mosin Nagant here has a 14 and a half inch barrel, but the brake is pinned and welded to ATF specifications in place to make the overall length still at the 16 and a half inch uh, limit. So now, a lot of people ask, yeah. is that legal? Yeah. Well, well, yes, it barely meets they, the They see that tiny barrel and they think, wow, that barrel looks mm -hmm. awful short. So, guys, it is a cosmetic thing. Uh, you know, sure, having the shorter barrel, yeah, the gun will throw some bigger fireballs. It'll look kind of cool on the range. But, you know, the brake is mainly just there to well, meet the overall length. And, too, a little tip about measuring barrel lengths that we learned from Ray is on guns like this, it's hard to say, okay, where does the barrel end? Well, the barrel ends where the breech begins. So you close the bolt, stick a dowel rod down until it hits the bolt face, put you a witness mark or something on your dowel rod, pull it out, measure that line, and there's your barrel length. That is exactly how the ATF is going to check it. If you're even a tenth of an inch or even less than a tenth of an inch under that minimum legal limit, you're toast. That's right. That's it. You, if you're, you're a found in violation. 15.95 inches is still less than 16 inches. So guys, there, there's a lot of random things with NFA. I mean, I hope that we've covered things a good bit. Um, one thing I do want to talk a little bit more about is suppressors and suppressor hosts. Mm -hmm. Okay, a suppressor host is any factory gun or aftermarket gun that has been threaded uh, for uh, the use of a suppressor. Now, this gun from Ruger uh, Direct uh, comes with the threaded barrel that's one of their pack lights, nice little lightweight gun. Mm -hmm. Now here's a weird thing too. Um, from an NFA standpoint, and let's just say what transfers on a gun form or whatever, usually if, you know, you're, say you're buying a handgun, usually the serial number component that is considered the firearm is the frame of the pistol. Well, that's not necessarily NFA in this point because this right. is just a suppressor host, this is just a regular pistol. Correct. But on the, um, on the Rugers here, 
the upper is actually the serialized portion. The upper is the firearm, mm -hmm. not the lower. So now, that's just a little interesting tidbit there. In you case you, didn't you know. can buy a standard like uh, Mark II target pistol or whatever, or Mark III, and you can buy like Taxol uppers for them, but they have to transfer through your dealer. Unlike AR-15 uppers, which you can just have shipped to your door because they're a non-serialized item. Yep. The suppressor is the actual serialized NFA item that Correct. you have to, you know, actually put on a Form 4 and transfer yep. through a gun shop. So these these guys, $200 uh, tax on any suppressor. They're all the same. Uh, suppressors come in a lot of varying configurations, both in the construction uh, of the suppressor mm -hmm. and the materials used to make the suppressor can affect the cost of the suppressor. So guys, cans can vary from anything from just simple aluminum, like the little Hunter Town there. It's just a nice basic aluminum can uh, with what they call a K-baffle system. Mm -hmm. K-baffles are pretty much the simplest to produce, the cheapest to produce, and one of the sort of oldest style of baffle systems used in suppressors. They're very effective, they're very cost effective, and they work. And they're fairly self-cleaning for the most part as well. They are. So. Uh, then you have uh, what they call a monolithic baffle. Now monolithic baffles are built into one big piece. Uh, you guys might remember the SIG MPX or you may know of the SIG MPX. Uh, the ATF was kind of getting down SIG's throat a little bit about the configuration of the MPX pistol because of the muzzle device that they were shipping them out with. Mm -hmm. It was the ultimate sort of take that ATF thing because you had a short barrel mm -hmm. with the uh, permanently muzzle affixed. brake muzzle permanently brake. attached to the front. And guess what? The muzzle brake was essentially a monolithic suppressor baffle system. Baffle system. All right. Mm -hmm. Then you would just buy your registered tube, mm -hmm. slide it over the front of the guns, put your cap on place. down, and bam, mm -hmm. you've got an in integral suppressed. MPX, short barrel, mm -hmm. nice and quiet, there she is. But SIG is still fighting the ATF on that, to my knowledge. Right. They, they appealed on it, and we haven't really heard anything back on it yet, at least the MPX in that configuration. But, you know, there are, um, well, there's a lot of great videos about suppressors out there. Uh, Tim at Military Arms Channel has a great video all about suppressors. If you just oh, search yeah. on there, they tell you everything there is to know about it, which we'll probably get... Uh, into a very long video if we start talking about that, but yeah, yeah, suppressors. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, guys. You know, it's just well, uh, you have like quick attach and then direct thread suppressors. I have a um, uh, an AAC SDN6 762 suppressor, and it is a um, quick attach style suppressor. It basically, has a 51 tooth ratcheting system built into the muzzle brake. You just put the suppressor on, ratchet it down, and then there it is. And uh, 762 cans can be used on smaller calibers as well. So I use that can on 308, 300 blackout, 556. So but um, you know, without getting into too many details, basically we'll say quickly that suppressors uh, come in a variety of different construction materials, mm -hmm. construction methods, which affect their price, mm -hmm. and that's where the differences in some of the prices come from. Also, um, dedicated suppressors for dedicated uh, type firearms. Mm -hmm. You know, usually most people that are in suppressors will have a dedicated 22 can. Mm -hmm. They'll have a dedicated, pistol usually a can. dedicated 5.56 five, can, mm -hmm. maybe a dedicated pistol caliber. Like I myself, I'm a 45 ACP kind of guy when it comes to suppressors because all 45 ACP, with the exception of very few rounds, is all subsonic. So we won't get into all of that right at this moment, but know that you as an individual can buy a suppressor. Yes, they are legal. Mm -hmm. Now, Well, most places they are legal. There are a few yeah. states around the country that will not allow NFA at all. There's a few states that won't allow certain NFA type items, whether it be suppressors yeah. or SBSs or SBRs. If I remember right, I know people are fighting those type of rulings around the country, and you know we're getting ahead on that front. But there are still places that will not allow any of these items to be owned by civilians. Correct. So, so you know it is kind of a jurisdictional type thing. So check with your local law enforcement. Check with your local jurisdiction. Make sure that you know what you're looking at in this video is legal in your area before attempting to go about it. On suppressors, I will mention one more thing before we close things out. Um, if you want to build a rifle that has integral suppression, okay, you can do so. Mm -hmm. um, you can submit a Form 1 and you can uh, spec everything out, give them the barrel length, give them the you know, length of the... Uh, basically your barrel uh, becomes a suppressor. So say that I want to take a Ruger 1022 takedown and turn the entire length of the barrel 
into a suppressor. I could register just the barrel component on uh, the, t the takedown. I could buy a standard barrel, not have to register the receiver of the firearm. I could register a physical barrel as a suppressor. Well, now, so if you're a, a handy machinist type or something like that, you want to port the barrel all the way the full length of the barrel, make yourself a uh, you know some type of a, a tube and baffle system in order to create that, you can make your own suppressor uh, generally. Of course, check with your local uh, laws in your state. A lot of people will produce their own integrally suppressed guns. You know, people make like Delisle carbines all the time, the 45 ACP infield carbines. Yeah. You know, if you're a savvy machinist, people build those type of guns all the time because they're rare and hard to find and whatnot. And you, you can, can build save them. a lot of money you by building a lot of money. Own. Just build a replica. Yeah. Um, but also, people do build their own suppressors. You just form one it, give the dimensions to the ATF, they approve it, and then there it is. And that comes down to another another kind of crazy point we'll cover in a minute, but I want to talk a little bit about the 86 Hughes Amendment and machine guns and whatnot. Uh, that's one thing we mentioned earlier, people come in all the time and they look on the wall and they say, oh, are these machine guns? Oh, yeah. those automatic. No, sir, they're, they're semi-automatic firearms. We don't, we don't have any select fire weaponry in this shop. Although we're a class three dealer, we can take select fire guns in for repair purposes. You know, or testing purposes, whatever, and then we send them back, take them in from dealers here and there, or individuals or other dealers that own the guns, and they send them to us for repair. You know, yep. Ray's known for that around the industry. Um, but machine guns could be owned by anybody as long as they were transferable, and transferable means they were registered with the ATF prior to, I think it was May of 1986, somewhere right so. around there, springtime 1986. The Hughes Amendment came down, basically stopped the sale of newly manufactured machine guns to civilians. Yeah. So immediately, pretty much overnight, the prices started trickling up. You know, used to, when, when Barry worked at RPB, you could buy a Mac-10 for 600 bucks. Yeah. And then you pay $200, register it, and then boom, Bam. there you go. There There's it your, is. It's already, in, it's already a select fire gun. So then it becomes this just crazy supply and demand thing. Um, you know, transferable machine guns, and we've, we've discussed this in previous gun gripes. Barry and I have. I know Chad and I probably mm -hmm. hinted on it here and there. You know, transferable machine guns are very uh, expensive. So that's why when someone comes in and they go, hey, um, I want a full auto AK. Can you make this full auto? Mm, no. no. <laughs> I cannot make it full auto, and nor can you. But say you wanted to buy a transferable uh, machine gun that was, you know, uh, either registered, manufactured, or produced prior to the 86 ban, well, then guess what? You're talking thirty-five dollars to $45,000. Entry-level pricing for select fire guns on the transferable market is like RPB or like Cobra, MAC-10s, MAC-11s, and they're yeah. going to run anywhere from on the very low end when someone's trying to get rid of the gun right now, $3,500 bucks. You know, up to about five or six thousand dollars, and sometimes you can get uh, kit forms. You know, you can get one with like a five five six upper. Yep. You know, they make five five six uppers for them. They make twenty two uppers for them. And we've run twenty two uppers on those guns to no avail, and they are so fun. Well, that's you know? why those guns are so popular, is because there's so many different aftermarket accessories for a transferable Mac Ten. If you buy, but you got to get the Mac Ten. You got to get the Mac Ten. Guys, if, if you're wanting to get into entry level transferable NFA stuff. Pass on the Mac 11. I know it's tempting. Find an RPB Mac 10. Mm -hmm. You got to get the one with the bigger frame because there are a ton of awesome accessories you can get. There's a guy right now. Uh, forgive me. I don't know the uh, the name of the company, but there's a guy right now developing a full auto uh, belt fed Aguila mini shell upper for the mm -hmm. Mac 10. So imagine having a hundred Aguila mini shells and a belting. <laughs> you know, just pretty, pretty crazy to run one of those on yeah. the Mac 10 upper. Um, yeah. But you know, talking about transferable guns. I mean, all right most popular ones out there, okay, an M4, all right? You know, oh, well, I can just, you know, get me a, a select fire kit or an auto sear or whatever from M4. Eh, not really. No. You can't just buy one. You can't just buy the parts and put them in and it'd be legal. And you can't manufacture it. That's the thing. No. So the whole 86 uh, ban put a stopper on that. I used to see auto sears, you know, like drop in auto sears. They were like ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. Yeah. Full Our guns. lightning links were like ten grand. Lightning links used to be like 5500 bucks, and they just... <laughs> trickled on up when people yeah. started finding out about them. It's a supply and demand thing. It's crazy you know? to think that you're going to pay $12,000 for like a little piece of basically sheet like a hacksaw blade is about <laughs> all it dang is, you know. But uh, transferable <laughs> M4s or M16s or like old Colt, like uh, the SP1 style guns, they can range anywhere from twenty dollars to $30,000. Yeah. Uh, full auto bars, 
I mean, forty-five grand. Oh God! You know? And some of the collectible Thompson submachine guns. Oh, good God! I mean, like if you got like an old twenty-seven or twenty-eight deluxe, you know, an old, you know, an old like mafia-style gun with the full stock and the drum magazine and everything. I mean, some of those guns in very collectible condition can run upwards of two hundred fifty thousand yep. dollars. And very, very rare guns like the uh, the original Robinson or the original um, Stoner Stoner sixty threes. You know, those guns in a transferable configuration can fetch well over $100,000. And I believe that there's like one guy who owns pretty much 90% of the entire collection of those guns, as well as all the parts on the market. Yep. So you want to talk about a monopoly on uh, a niche part of the market, there yep. it is. You know, in a lot of cases, these guns are investment grade firearms. Yep. Now, the caveat to that is if the NFA was ever repealed then overnight, it would be like a stock market crash. You know, values on those guns would go <laughs> since you can, oh, well, I can just manufacture my own M4 now. Oh, well, that, that old Colt, yeah, it went from being 25 grand to being maybe $2,000. You know, just like you can buy one off the shelf if you're law enforcement in the military. Correct. It, it's just insane. Now, there's another thing. Dealers, if you're, if you're a class three dealer, you know, or if you're like a, an 07 manufacturer, you have special permitting, special licensing, you can buy guns as dealer samples and have them in your stock. They don't belong to you, they belong to your business. And you know, they're not transferable to your children upon your death or anything like that. They have to go to another dealer and things like that. That's how we get a lot of the machine guns that you see on the channel. We have friends that bring the guns down to us that are class sevens, class tens, SOTs. They own the firearms as dealer samples. They bring them down, we yep. shoot the crap out of them and we have a lot of fun with it, and that's kind of how we get those yeah, types no of guns. no civilian owns those guns. So no. here's the odd thing, guys, and without getting too involved, because I know we, well, this video is already getting very long, but we're trying to make sure that people get a good grasp on exactly what is involved in this stuff. Uh, basically what happens is uh, the dealer gets uh, what they call a love letter. Mm. Well, it's technically a law letter, but law we, letter. Call we call them love letters. letters. So say that I have a good relationship with my local Clio, you know, we're buddies or whatever, and I own a business where I can, you know, I have my manufacturing license, I can manufacture, I'm an upstanding uh, citizen in my community, uh, you know, the, the citizenry like me, they know who I am, law enforcement knows who I am, they know my family. Yes, you can go to your Clio and go, yeah, um, I'd like to manufacture two uh, M4s, full auto, uh, will you give me permission uh, on a law letter to manufacture those guns? The uh, law letter consists basically it's a demo letter. Okay, so it's the Clio has to request that firearm as a demo gun for demonstration purposes. Mm -hmm. So basically, the guise of it—I hate to use the word guys—but the guise of it is, hey, my unit or my uh, my unit, my SWAT team, my my department, we want to check out this gun and see if it's something we want to have. Mm -hmm. So the civilian can manufacture it, have it as a part of his business, and that way that that Clio can call that person up at any time and go, you know what? Um, remember that thing we talked about? Uh, we need to test out that MP5 to see if it's something we want to have in our uh, in our possession, uh, if it's worth doing. They bring the demo gun out, they get to play with them, shoot them, have fun with them. Okay, we'll get them. Okay, we won't. But the business can maintain the demo gun in their inventory for demonstration mm -hmm. purposes. Now, that's how we get a lot of the firearms that we end up using uh, in our videos. Like, you know, we did a video on the P90. Mm -hmm. A P90 is a law enforcement demo uh, machine gun. Only. Law I mean, enforcement pretty much. Only. It's, it's military law enforcement only because it was produced new after 1986. It was never introduced before 1986. They were produced in the early 90s. And that's why you'll never see a civilian owned like Glock 18. Yep. Because Glock 18s were produced, you know, after uh, the 86 ban. So, much. guys, there's a ton of random things that go into this. This is just sort of scratching the surface, but what I hope you'll do is take some time to learn more about NFA. Uh, don't take everything from our word. Do some research. Look into it. Get involved. Uh, there are a lot of uh, you know things going on in the industry, like with Silencer Co. Uh, they've got Silencer Co. has been one of the companies that I'm very proud of because those guys really have done a great job in trying to physically change the way that the society looks at suppressors, well, the way that the law enforcement handles you know the 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 enforcement of laws with suppressors, and speeding up the process uh, for some to be able to obtain a, a suppressor and They're, trying to make it an over-the-counter deal. Yeah, they are certainly one of the manufacturers that have just kind of uh, spearheaded this entire movement to you know, change the public's perception on suppressors. And it has been working in a lot of cases. A yes. lot of people start realizing now that suppressors aren't these 
evil silencers that you see on the movies that are just clandestine only, you know, only assassins use suppressors. Right. No, they have a lot of benefits. Yeah. You know, they, they reduce muzzle flash. They reduce um, felt recoil. They reduce, they reduce the sound signature yep. of larger firearms and make it a more enjoyable shooting experience. Yep. And in It's a courtesy to your neighbors it, if well, you live in, a, in a, maybe a heavy, heavily populated area and you're making a lot of racket all the time. Having suppressors is a nice way to, to be a little bit nicer to your neighbors who may not appreciate all the loud gunfire all the time. So yep. uh, there are a lot of changing things going on uh, both in the industry and in, in society when it comes to how people view well, suppressors. There's very good organizations out there too like the American Suppressor Association the ASA, you know, they do a lot to lobby for the suppressor industry itself, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get the laws changed to make suppressors over-the-counter purchases. You can go to Europe, if you're, if you're a European citizen, a lot of the countries over there, they, they recommend suppressors for hunting. You can just go into a gun shop and buy a bolt-action rifle that's threaded and you can buy a suppressor and walk yeah. right out the door and go they kill They want a deer. the guns to be quieter <laughs> from a noise uh, noise pollution, pollution standpoint. standpoint. So, yeah. guys, anyway, we hope this gave you some food for thought. We hope you learned something from today's video. If you ever have any questions about anything that you see in these videos, give us a call up here at Moss. We'll be happy to fill you in. Uh, a lot of the things you see right here on the counter are available here at Moss. Don't hesitate to give us a call. We'll do what we can to help. Uh, so, guys, we appreciate you watching today's video. We know it was long, uh, but hopefully you learned something. Again, any questions, uh, leave them in the comments below. Is there something we didn't cover that you think we should have covered? Leave it in the comment section below. Uh, were we wrong about something that we should have been right on and, and you're going shame on you? Leave it in the comment section below. Yeah. Uh, the but thing make sure is, it's nice or we'll find you. The thing is, I mean, we're, we're in the gun industry and it's even confusing to us. I mean, we can't yeah. imagine what it's like you know, being on the other side of the table. I mean, it, it is a very complicated subject. Just the it NFA, is. the Gun Control Act, 1986, the Hughes Amendment, the whole nine yards. And the it's bad just, thing is almost purposely. Oh. It's almost purposely confusing because it's like they want you to slip up. No, they want your head to explode is what it is. Yeah, you know? that, well, or they want it to be so obnoxious that someone just goes, you know what, all this NFA stuff is just too, 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 too much complicated. Head, yeah. too complicated. You know what, I'm just not going to bother. I'm going to stick to my little whatever and not worry about it. So yeah. they want it to be confusing so that it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very unattractive option. Mm -hmm. So guys, don't let it, don't let it uh, perturb you. Don't let it put you off. Get into it. It's fun. Lots of cool stuff. But guys, we appreciate you watching today's video again. Uh, I know it was long, but uh, we'll catch you next time. Much more in the pipeline. Take it easy. Have a good one.